Well, hello, we're live. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, whatever it is in your specific time zone. Uh, we are welcoming you to uh, this NIA Bright Talk presentation, The Ethics of Artificial Intelligence. I am your host and moderator, Jim Fister. Uh, I run my own company, The Decision Place, and I am also a private contractor for SNEA. I work on application enabling programs as well as moderating various Bright Talks. Uh, Rob, why don't you say hi to everyone? Hi. I actually probably want a little bit more than that. I'm a technology analyst, uh, been in the field since uh, 1994, uh, working for a variety of firms, starting with uh, Gig and then ending up with my own firm, and I cover technology broadly. Excellent. And Eric, why don't you introduce yourself as well? Good morning as well. I am a practicing security and privacy professional, been working with SNEA since probably 2004 timeframe. So um, one of those odd birds that, that likes storage and security. And Eric, you win the acronym uh, war today. Uh, you know, it's you, you certainly you certainly managed to put a lot of acronyms after the name, which I which I think is always fun. You know, I, I can't even do like a junior or a senior or anything like that. So, folks, uh, if you're if you're aware, I think many of you have probably been to Bright Talks before. If not, uh, you do have the option, uh, and I have a different interface than you do, but uh, there is an option. Uh, you'll see a couple of things there, and we'll get to them as we go. But uh, first of all, you can see uh, uh, a link to the material, and we have provided the material there, and we will also have it posted at the SNEA Ed Library once this Bright Talk finishes. And you also have the ability there to enlarge your screen. So if you want to look at the uh, things, you can. Um, we will actually be mostly a live panel today. Uh, we're not going to do a lot of slides. We figured it would be more fun to talk about this than it would to bore you with a bunch of slides. But let me hit you with a couple things up front. Uh, this is a Storage Networking Industry Association presentation. SNEA itself is 185 industry-leading organizations with over 2,000 active contributing members. And we reach out to over 50,000 IT end users, storage professionals worldwide. Um, our goal in the Cloud Storage Technologies Initiative is to educate uh, on cloud storage, data services, orchestration, cloud technologies overall. We want to support and promote the various business models and architectures. We want you to understand the different requirements and how to incorporate those into standards and programs. And then we're going to collaborate with others. And we're always looking for more people to help, and we'll talk about that at the end as well. One thing, uh, Eric does a lot of work with the ABA, but uh, Eric, I don't believe you're a lawyer. Rob, you're not a lawyer. Um, uh, I got my bachelor's degree and got the heck out of college, so I didn't get to law school. So none of us are lawyers today. So we will be talking about things, but none of this should be construed as legal advice. So this material is copyrighted by SNEA unless otherwise noted. And this is basically personal opinions and current understanding. But this is something that, uh, you know, we all uh, live every day from, a, from an AI ethics standpoint. And we think that this should be educational. As always, uh, feel free to ask questions. I have a couple of questions to always get us started, but uh, I will be monitoring the questions as we have the chat. And uh, Feel free to ask any as, you, as they come up and we'll insert them in as we go. So today we're going to talk about ethics. Uh, ethics, as I looked up in the dictionary, it's the moral principles that govern the behavior or the conducting of an activity, or it's the branch of knowledge that deals with moral, moral principles. So really the theme today is when we create AI to react faster than our speed of thought and make its own decisions, how do you also create an ethical AI? And that's why uh, we brought these two great experts, Rob and Eric, uh, on to have this conversation. And this is gonna be a round table. Um, we will talk about, uh, you know, how could AI make things better? How could AI make things worse? Sometimes I, sometimes I follow the pessimistic side. Uh, we'll maybe talk about the famous modern trolley dilemma uh, that we see in AI. Uh, we'll talk about how to source your information or whether the web is the source of all information for your AI. Uh, we will talk about legal and technology standards, but again, uh, won't be talking about providing legal advice. Uh, and then we do want to touch on corporate organizational thinking. What would it be like to uh, form a, an AI organization and how would you organize and, you know, what are some of the good examples and bad examples around that? And we'll probably talk about a bunch of other things. So what I will do is I will end our slides and here we are back to the video. 
And so let's get it started. I, you know, when we were doing the prep on this, uh, Rob, I think we were talking about some of the most recent hacks. And one of the ones we talked about was the one that was what, probably three, four weeks ago with the, at the water uh, plant in Florida. Um, that wasn't an AI attack, but why don't you talk a little bit about what happened there and how it could have potentially been much worse uh, had that been AI doing it rather than humans? Well, I think in the case of the of the Florida uh, hack, uh, you had a, an automated system that was governing the amount of chlorine that was going to going into the water supply. Uh, somebody was able to penetrate that system and adjust it so the uh, the amount of chlorine that was going to the water supply would would make you sick. Uh, and for anybody on the edges, it, it, it might even kill you. Uh, the the uh, I think it was up up a hundred to a thousand x the the, uh, the total of the monitor, the person monitoring the uh, uh, the system was able to see what was going on and was able to revert it back to what it should be. The danger is it is showcased I think with regard to AI is typically this would be a system that would be run in the future by an artificial intelligence, and were that artificial intelligence altered in some way or just simply. Uh, the algorithm had been misset up, so a trigger event came in, and suddenly it was dumping a ton of chlorine in the water supply to address some secondary problem. Let's say there was a sensor report that indicated uh, an excess growth in one part of the system, and the AI couldn't make a determination between that part and the rest of the system, or it didn't have a condition that had been put in place to prevent it from killing people to solve the problem. It would just go on and 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 put in the chlorine to, to, to solve the problem that it saw, uh, not recognizing the fact that it was going to kill a bunch of people because that had not been program programmed into the system. And this goes to the core of, of ethics and in, in, in how you set up an AI. Um, ethics to me are the application of, of morals or rules that you put in place to define how something is supposed to, supposed to perform its task, kind of the difference between right and wrong so if, it, if you're talking about a human in that particular case, clearly right would be to try to deal with this uh, problem and put in place chlorine. Wrong would be putting in so much chlorine, you're killing the people that are using the water. Uh, and so that, that really kind of defines our issue. And of course, AIs can make decisions in milliseconds. Um, humans don't make decisions that quickly. And so the danger is that an AI controlling some critical infrastructure whether it be traffic lights, water, power, um, makes, a, makes a decision at machine speeds and before anybody can react, a whole bunch of people are dead. And, um, and that's probably the biggest concern right now with regard to AI, AI and ethical behavior is the fact that they can make wrong decisions at machine speeds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just you actually touched on. Oh, go ahead, Eric. I was just gonna, so picking up on that, I mean, what, what, what you're really getting at is, um, the 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 full scope of the issue may not be on the table when you're working the AI. You 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 know the the designer may have been thinking of very narrowly how they were going to apply it, but you know all the context, all the considerations that really need to be factored in may not have actually been uh, planned for and adapted for. And you know th th this just again picking up on the example you had. This is a situation where where uh you know combined with iot which could equally be fast <laughs> um you can definitely get into to trouble um in a, in a rapid way and in no way to basically inject a human to basically correct it you know in time yeah one, one of the other examples that i used recently was was out of amazon uh the they'd set up uh amazon is is heavily automated um one of the most heavily automated companies on the planet at the moment Mm -hmm. And uh, part of their analytics uh, was to monitor, as you would expect, timeliness of delivery. And, um, and a few years back, Amazon was getting a lot of reports with regard to deliveries coming in late. And I mean really late, weeks, months late. Uh, yet none of the central reports, were reporting mechanisms were showing this. All these reports are coming in from customers who are getting their product, their product in late uh, and were really upset about it, but the internal monitors weren't showing a problem at all. And, and what had happened was when the analytics were set up, the um, uh, central distribution points 
because they weren't supposed to deliver deliver to customers directly. They were supposed to deliver to regional distribution points, and those points were delivering to customers. Those central distribution points had weren't capturing any data with regard to delivery. And yet one manager of a central distribution point decided to save time because the people that they were delivering to were, were local, that they would deliver out of that central distribution point. And those were the deliveries that were showing up ma massively late. But because the analytics hadn't been set up to even monitor those deliveries because the person doing the programming didn't believe they would ever happen, that was those were all missed. And, and that kind of showcases one of the problems with regard to automating something like that, because here we had people involved, it was no AI, and there were huge mistakes being made, largely because the way it was set up, the system wasn't capturing the data it needed to capture in order to identify the problem and mitigate it. Same thing can happen with an AI. If it's set up incomplete, so either their data elements that aren't going in or those data elements are corrupted, then the AI starts making mistakes. There's nothing wrong with the AI. It's working as it's supposed to. It's receiving bad data and the bad data is causing the AI uh, to cause problems. If you remember a, a, a few years back, uh, we had the Die Hard series of movies and the, and the way that the, I think it was the Die Hard 2 or 3, um, where they reset the, the, um, the altitude of the airport and the mm -hmm. idea was the planes were under under autopilot. We're going to fly themselves right down into the runway, and um, and crash. Which was it was a legitimate concern because the, if your plane showing the wrong altitude, um, then there is a chance it's going to fly into the ground. Fortunately, planes have redundant systems that would certainly identify you're getting pretty damn close to the ground. But the but the uh, but if you're letting the the uh, autopilot land the plane, it may not react to that change, and it could legitimately crash the airline once again showcase the underlying problem with ethics. And it clearly, and the, and the biggest, of course, ethical problem we had was early on with ethics was with facial recognition, where the test systems were set up largely using the images of the scientists that were creating the, the platform, which were old white guys. And the prior test uh, sequences were set up using animals. And so as soon as they started to try to scan a broad audience, particularly people of color, the system made the incorrect connection between people of color and apes and chimpanzees, which of course created a huge problem for people of color and the, and the platforms, because suddenly you had a system that was behaving in a very um, racist fashion, yet it hadn't been designed to be racist. It was the nature of the, of the test set. So I should take it back. It was designed to be racist. It just wasn't the intent that that be the case, largely because the, uh, the training sets had been so unintentionally biased and, and so badly so that eventually IBM exited the segment because there was no real way to assure that the facial recognition training sets were going to be, uh, were going to be accurate. And, and they didn't want to take the brand damage associated with having a biased AI system, especially when there were no leaders with artificial intelligence. So it's just, showing, <laughs> it's just a number of ways that bias and unethical a potentially unethical behavior can influence an AI uh, and make it bad. And of course, the final example was the uh, Microsoft uh, bot, uh, where Microsoft created it, put it on, put it on Twitter with the idea it was going to behave well, and then people gamed the uh, the bot and through their responses trained it to behave very badly in a very racist and uh, an objectionable form. It wasn't designed that way. It trained itself to be that way based on what humans did to it. So you can take a, a, an AI that might start out being ethical and by nature of the information you're putting into it, cause it to behave unethically or in this case in a racist fashion. So there are a ton of ways to screw up an AI. Well, that actually leads to the to the discussion around data. And, uh, you know, one of one of my favorite examples, uh, you know, along those lines was uh, I can remember somebody talking about a test methodology and they were trying to determine two animals, an elephant versus a rhino. And the AI dutifully looked through the elephants and the rhinos and it could identify them in the test cases very easily. And then as soon as they put it out to the wild, pun intended, uh, the system completely failed. What it turned out was the pictures of elephants were all taken in one place with one camera and the pictures of the rhinos were all taken in a separate place with a different camera. The AI, okay. the AI actually um, latched onto the camera tag as the way to be able to identify an elephant versus a rhino. And so when that camera tag wasn't available, when it started getting millions more pictures, the system failed. So this comes down to there's 
bad data that can potentially go in like in that example or in that Microsoft example, but how do you actually select the data that you want to provide to the AI? And is there an ethical bias that you can uh, that you can create or, or perhaps mistakenly put in uh, as a result of picking the data for, uh, as a human? Yeah, th this 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 bias issue is is a big concern. Uh, I, I know like in the in the legal community, they're they're definitely worrying about and, and it can be completely unintended, um, yeah. Or, or something starts, you know, as a as a hobby or a sort of a pilot or something, and, it, and it, over time it grows into, you know, full blown sort of production solution. But nobody ever goes back and resets the the uh, the, the data that it started with, and and uh, because of the way. You know the the authors or the you know the programmers had had kicked it off so to speak. It, it may have have this bias built into it that you can't shed. Um, you know, and and so I think uh, when when you combine that kind of a problem, where then you're you're making decisions that um, you know, for example, getting loans. And things of that nature, where you're, you know, it's it's actually a, a tool to sort of help guide or actually make decisions. That bias can be a huge problem, and, and definitely the legal community, the regulators, are trying to figure out how to how to deal with those and struggling in many cases. Mm -hmm. yeah, it kind of goes back to that old uh, adage: "Garbage in, garbage out." The the currently the the if if you if you start being selective with regard to your data set, you're introducing intentionally or unintentionally bias into the result. The, the uh, current advice is you, you don't muck with the data set. The data set, the, your initial data set's got to be as raw as you can possibly, as possibly make it. And then you, if you make subsequent decisions to refine that data set, you, if, you, if you leave the originating data set intact, you at least have the possibility of going back and, and revisiting those decisions and correcting the mistake. But if you alter the data set from the beginning, then the data that you need to, to correct the behavior, you didn't capture. And, the, and if you don't have it, you don't, you don't have it. And then, and then the bias becomes endemic to the system. The system mm -hmm. will likely fail. Mm -hmm. so, it's, so, so inserting bias in the data space is, is very likely it's bad. Uh, a human problem, not necessarily an AI problem. The AI... It can potentially has the ability to go to go suss that out faster than the human can. Well, take for instance, let's say let's say you once again back to facial recognition, where we've had a ton of problem. We had a series of cameras that wouldn't actually see black people. Uh, the the uh, and that wasn't an AI problem. That was a sensor problem. So the so mm -hmm. the uh, um, and so that sensor problem had to be corrected. Otherwise, you you were going to get miscounts, or just simply you're going to be pointing at at, at people, and the system mm -hmm. wasn't going to accept that it was people. Which was introducing bias into that underlying system. It, it showcases as you're developing an AI, the critic, the critical thing you need to develop as part of the path is is heavy simulation. Uh, you have to be able to run it through real time, um, photorealistic, accurate simulations uh, over a long period of time, so that you identify the bias problems and the behavior problems with the AI before you take it live. What you don't want is you don't want a system that's going out in the real world. Let's take an autonomous driving system that goes out in the real world. You, you, you don't want to find out that it doesn't recognize trucks the first time it rams into a truck. You want to find that on simulation so that ram is done virtually and nobody is killed in the process. So the, so the, uh, so that's one of the issues we have right now is we do have decent and very robust simulation systems. It's just the people that are developing the AIs aren't consistently using them. Mm -hmm. uh, and often what happens is the rush to market, the desire to, desire to get the system in place and operating generating revenue can take can take uh, priority over the need to test that system uh, accurately and deeply. You could look at it in terms of the problem we had problems we had with the the um, the uh, 737s where a good chunk of them were grounded. Uh, that was due largely to the fact that testing was bypassed in order to get those planes to market very rapidly. And as a result, one of the systems in the planes was not operating properly and caused several of the planes to to uh, to crash catastrophically and resulting in a fairly significant problem for Boeing. We're now not a lot of us trust that uh, that company to build safe airlines. And so their their decision 
their short-term tactical decision with regard to the 737 created a strategic problem for them that may still put them out of business long-term if they don't correct the behavior. Because now if a couple more planes go down, like we just saw with the 777s, I think, with regard to bad uh, bad engines, it, it just still connects back to the back to the Boeing brand and, and then people don't want to fly on the plane. Great thing for Airbus, not so great for, for Boeing. So it's critical that these things get corrected, these, ba these bad decisions uh, in terms of putting uh, time to market in front of safety and security uh, are corrected and caught early before the products come out. Otherwise, we're going to have a, a train wreck. And that these same kinds of decisions may eventually cause the end of major companies like Google and Facebook, who have major ethics problems. Yeah. And, and Eric, I, th I think you're aware of some of the IEEE standards that are going on. And that was one of the questions to the audience or comment from the audience in terms of there's a couple of IEEE uh, working group standards on ethics and bias in AI. Uh, is that something you're familiar with? You know, I've, I've actually, you know, taken a look at them. You know, you're referring to the, the 7000 series standards. Um, th they were um, some of the very, very first to come out dealing with with ethics and, and and bias, and in fact, uh, you know, there's there's now an uh, an ISO activity dealing with artificial intelligence as well, and uh, they're definitely paying attention to to some of the early work that that IEEE has done. Um, you know, uh, usually when you have a like a ISO activity starting up, they focus on things like vocabulary and you know frameworks and and whatnot. So they're they're sort of work through some of that uh, and they're now beginning to kind of move on to to little meteor kind of topics like the like the issue of bias which um, what was kind of fascinating to see that that showed up almost from day one as something that had to be had to be addressed and, mm -hmm. and you know, define what, what what do you mean by bias how do you how do you try to deal with it and and of course, they're dealing with machine learning as well as AI. Um, interesting enough, uh, they had a, a big data activity that was uh, in, in a separate committee, and they made a decision to actually fold the big data in with the the AI compete. So it's back to some of the comments you were making about uh, uh, you know, you, if you're garbage in, garbage out. They wanted to make sure that the you know the, the standards that we're dealing with these large sources of data. Um, you know, uh, most likely we're going to have impacts on on AI and machine learning kind of scenarios. Um, so yeah, I think the the the, the IEEE work is is pretty foundational that that's out there right now. Um, I think a lot of governments have basically looked at at what IEEE had to say, and they're they're trying to leverage some of that to the degree they can. Um, I, I think in in when I sort of look out at the landscape, so to speak, um, you know, we're seeing AI show up in lots and lots of places. Um, and I, and the, the interactions or the interplay between these different forms of AI is going to be, uh, I think, a, an interesting sort of collision space. Uh, again, because you, you don't know what each will learn from each other. And you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's the part that, um, back to your comment about simulations and whatnot, um, that may actually be hard to simulate. Uh, you know, when when these different AIs are are interdependent in uh, and uh, working for and against each other, uh, uh, you know, I think we're gonna we're gonna see lots of uh, interesting problems. And of course, humans in the middle of all this, you know, with the safety component, is uh, I think got a lot of people spooked right now. Yeah, and that leads to to a to an interesting area, and you know, I, I called it the modern trolley problem. Although the existing trolley problem is still a pretty good one, but there are some questions in terms of you know talking about ethical decisions, and this comes to you know it's it's a question that I ask when I'm talking to high school kids about technology, but I know that some of the bigger companies, especially in autonomous driving, have taken this on as well, with some really interesting results. So it effectively comes down to um, if I'm driving an automated vehicle of some type or another, let's say it's an automated car um, and the car is presented, uh, so to speak, with an option of uh, having to uh, make a decision on what to hit. Uh, would that be, you know, a person or a child or a mailbox or a tree? 
what's the right thing for the car to do? Now we had some of this conversation in the in the prep as well. Uh, uh, Rob, I'll, I'll go to you first. You know, from, from so your the, perspective, what have so you the, heard, and 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 what what kind of decisions would be made? Well, it's as it's been applied to autonomous driving, it, it it's kind of a red herring. Uh, the the way I've seen it presented is the is the autonomous car is is heading down a road at speed. You've got a bus that's been turned over with a lot of kids in front on one side and some type of immovable barrier on the other. And you've got to, the car has a choice. It can either hit the students and the driver survives, but the students don't, or it hits the barrier and, and the driver doesn't survive and the students do. So what does the autonomous car do? Um, in almost all cases in, in real life, the autonomous car would hit neither of them. Uh, the, the autonomous car, if it's properly programmed, does not override its sensors. The kinds of problems human drivers have are they're using their smartphone, which would create this kind of a problem. Uh, they're, 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 it's at nighttime and they're driving faster than their headlights can display, display obstacles. Those are the kinds of things that, that human drivers, kinds of mistakes human drivers make an autom autonomous system that if it's properly programmed will not. It will not overdrive its sensors. Uh, the only time it would be presented with that kind of a problem would be for instance, if it hit a sheet of ice. It's coming down a hill. It does not sense the sheet of ice. The car is now ballistic on the sheet of ice. The car no longer has a choice. It, it's it's on ice. It's ballistic. Doesn't matter what the autonomous vehicle wants to do. It's going to hit wherever the car is is initially pointed. And so the it, that's why I call it kind of a red herring. Is the, the in most cases, in actually the vast majority of cases, the car is never going to be presented that. And the level of technology it has right now, it can identify objects but making it identify one object not to hit over another object not to hit is kind of beyond the technology at this particular moment. Now it could be, you could have a child that runs out between cars and the car now has a choice between hitting the child continuing sick, continuing ahead or going into opposing traffic, missing the child, but maybe killing both drivers, drivers in the car. Once again, though, the autonomous system if it can react, it's going to try to stop first, not swerve for first into traffic. And then if it does hit the child, it's gonna hit the child at a, at a slow point. And if LiDAR has been deployed, it probably saw the child approaching anyway, in which case it's already preloaded the brakes and will stop in time. So again, the kind of accident we're talking about is one that would, would rarely, if ever, a tap into a car, or if we're talking about a human driver, human driver wouldn't see the child approaching would almost always hit hit the child or possibly hit the child and then swerve into into opposing traffic killing the drive killing both drivers and creating maximum uh damage and the the autonomous vehicle at the very least would not do that um it would not it would not make the uh make the problem worse so that so it, it really kind of comes down to how we're designing these things if the car if the system is designed properly where it's not overdriving its sensors it's using LIDAR so it can see approaching threats like the child running between vehicles, then the odds of it actually having this kind of a problem are low. And in all cases, it's going to attempt to brake first and stop the vehicle. And in most cases, it will be successful. And where it's not, it'll be cut be because the physics of the situation make it so the car cannot avoid the accident um, and will therefore uh, cause the issue. Oh, one final thing in that example of the child. Um, in an advanced autonomous system, both the oncoming car and the approaching car would be talking to each other as they're approaching and could True. negotiate in microseconds a way to avoid all obstacles where a human driver would go kind of, oh crap. In fact, one of the one of the initial test cases when we were first talking about autonomous cars back in the early 2000s was when the autonomous vehicle ran into a problem it couldn't handle. It would turn over control to the driver. So a lot of us had this mental image of the driver going down the road, the autonomous car, which is capable of dealing with problems in microseconds, doesn't run into a problem. You're reading or napping or, or watching a movie and suddenly says, hey, the car says, I can't deal with it. You're going to crash and die. You get a microsecond to scream, oh, my God, and you're dead. So that, then they decided not to turn the control back over to the human to give us that last moment of screaming bloody murder as we go off a cliff or something. Uh, because there's not a damn if the, if the autonomous car can't deal with the problem, we certainly can't deal with the problem. So giving us back control wouldn't uh, wouldn't be viable. So, well, you know, so realistically, and, and I'll get to you in a second, Eric. So realistically, though, in an unsolvable condition, what you what you're telling the AI to do is nothing. Um, it has exhausted all of its opportunities. So don't try and exacerbate the situation by doing something worse. You've done everything you possibly can. Just break the def the, def the default would be attempt to stop as quickly as as uh, 
as possible and avoid the avoid the variables. But the nice thing is this is all done in simulation. So the so as we as we as we test these systems, we have children running out, virtual children running out from between cars. We have school buses and, and barriers that they test on, and, and they're all done virtually. So so no children or barriers are hurt in experimentation. And then and then we can best define okay, what are the parameters we have with regard to speed and, and speed limits. In most cases, where where the Thomas car gets into trouble is when the when the driver says, "Hey, you're going too slow. I need you to go faster," and overrides the safety protocols, and that's when the accident results. Mm -hmm. Right. So, Eric, go ahead and finish that. But I also want you to then touch on uh, some of the things that maybe the the lawyers uh, have been discussing. Again, we're not offering legal advice, but what have you heard in the ABA as to as to what things they're addressing? Okay. Well, I, I guess the you know on the on the the car theme, because I, I uh, spent quite a bit of time in in Japan over the last few years, and the the autonomous vehicle uh, discussion there was slightly different. They were actually in they had this problem of uh, people walking into the streets with their iPhones and and uh, you know smartphones, and and getting hit. Likewise with uh, trains, and and so what they were trying to do was factor the these these smart devices into the equation. So the person's actually looking at his phone, and the phone is basically telling him stop <laughs> because right. the vehicle coming at him. Uh, is, is basically going to hit him if uh, uh, you know if he if he continues on that path, and the vehicle may actually not be in a position to to, to respond. Kind of as you as you described, you know, it may be moving too fast, and this is one of those things coming in from the side. So, the, so in some cases, the Japanese were trying to to factor in the human element. You know, in the security world, it's always the human that's it's the broken piece, right? So, in in uh, some of the autonomous vehicles, they were trying to expand the problem set uh, out enough where some of these objects that would sort of come in randomly and unpredictably and sort of screw everything up, try and take that, factor that into the equation. Yeah, the broader um, you can get, you can spread your sensor net. So if you can include pedest pedestrians in the sensor net, uh, mm -hmm. other other vehicle, wagons, bicycles, whatever, they're all included in the sensor net, then the car becomes aware of them regardless of obstructions and can react to the danger and can alert, as you point out, to the person carrying the phone that they're about to step into traffic and die. And and that and that's probably the long term way to uh, to address the the question. I do know do see we're starting to get questions in with regard to ethics and liability as well now. Yeah, and that's yeah. where I was going to go to you, Eric. On, on what <laughs> what are some of the discussions going on there right now? Well, so so uh, relative to 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 AI, um, the the American Bar Association section section of science and technology law actually has an artificial intelligence and robotics committee that's that's been um, operational for a, a, a few years. I'm going to say on the order of about three years. Um, it, it actually has put on um, a couple of national institutes where they're, they're actually getting um, people in the legal community, regulators uh, together to, to discuss both, both the uh, you know the AI aspect and the robotics piece, and it's 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 an interesting combination. Um, a lot uh, there's a lot of autonomous vehicle discussion uh, that that comes into play there. They're they're looking at um, they're definitely looking at the bias piece. Um, you know companies that are not taking care to make sure bias is addressed in a reasonable fashion are are likely to encounter. Um, lawyers at some point, uh, lawyers that actually understand AI. Um, so, so it behooves companies that are, that are working in this space to, to, to pay attention, um, especially when the AI is making, you know, decisions that, that can have, you know, safety issues or just, you know, financial impacts is, you know, an area where there's a lot of concern. So, so the, the, the legal community is definitely engaging, um, some of this actually plays into the regulations in the U.S., whether it's state level or or federal level, because the ABA does um, does provide recommendations and whatnot, uh, and and it does monitor what's happening in Congress. So that um, 
you know, the, the legal community is basically engaging on this front. And it's, you know, it's not something <laughs> that, uh, uh, you know, is going to happen at some point in the future. They, they are engaged. They are. The robotics piece is of particular interest um, because it, it has the potential of, of uh, taking everything we were just discussing. And now, you know, it's completely autonomous. There's no human in the middle of this. And, you know, if, it, if it's doing something uh bad so to speak um you know how do how do you uh how do you stop that how do you deal with that and so mm -hmm. yeah they're definitely engaged i think i think it's safe to say that legal opinion on this is going to be fluid for a while but well, how to we get a large to degree today, we, we yeah. need some presence uh, the, the, like everything else the legal community responds to litigation and so it's the first set of cases that come through that set precedence Right now, the belief is if you've got a level five autonomous car, the liability will flow back to the manufacturer, which is why you're probably not going to see any level five autonomous cars any, anytime soon, even though the technology mm -hmm. is pretty close. Um, if, if as long as the driver can take control, then the driver will remain, remain uh, legally responsible for what the car does. Mm -hmm. I do know there's some really concerning stuff going on right now. For instance, cities are not allowing the cars to talk to the... Um, to the stoplight infrastructure because they recognize that if there's a problem with that infrastructure, it delivers the wrong message. So for instance, the car is told the light is green, but the light is actually red and that causes an accident, the liability would flow to the city. The cities, the cities have said, yeah, we do not want that liability. So we're not gonna let our system talk to the automobiles, which of course increases the probability the car might misread the, the, uh, the stoplight because it's using cameras to read the uh, stoplight. And so let's say you've got a situation where you're in fog and the stoplights are horizontal and not vertical. And so the, the, um, the camera reads the stoplight as green as, as, opposed to, as opposed to red and goes through. The city's okay with that kind of an accident where it would be avoided if the stoplight simply talked to the car wirelessly and the, and the car could see it. Or even worse, if the car can't see the light and proceeds through the intersection. Now, Right now, the default would be if the car can't see the light, it's going to stop. It's just going to say, you, you want to go through this intersection, you do it up. Um, it's too risky for me um, mm -hmm. and, and, and stop. But can you imagine any driver that's going to say, hey, no, I want to sit here until the fog lifts? <laughs> They're still going to try to proceed through the intersection and have the accident. And so th that is inherently unethical. The cities are, are taking the position that their own liability is more important than saving people's lives. And, and that's kind of problematic to the ethics as we roll this technology forward, we, we should be as should have as a priority saving life. If nobody dies, there's no litigation. Um, the, the focus shouldn't be on it, uh, on assuring a death, but me not being blamed for it over, over, over uh, primarily focusing on preventing the death in the first, first place. But unfortunately that's the kind of behavior that we're seeing in the, in the, uh, so it's a it's a layered liability aspect as well. The first thing I want to do is claim there's still a driver in the car, so I want to keep the driver awake. But now what I want to do is try and avoid problems that the driver could create without causing any other issues. But, you know, what's, what's interesting that comes into this, and this leads to another area of discussion, is as a company that's creating or developing AI, how do you organize and what are some of the good and bad examples of uh, organization that we've seen? Well, Google, probably good example, a good example of a bad, of bad behavior. They have lost two of their AI ethicists, high profile ethicists now because they got on the wrong side of Google's profit uh, margin. So the, so the, uh, um, so in the end, uh, it's not looking good in, in terms of some of the companies that are deploying AIs broadly that we interact with daily. Um, Facebook's uh, been in the news recently with their director of AI uh, was apologizing because of the, some of the really horrible decisions that company has made where they, where they put uh, the uh, company growth in front of behaving properly. And, and if you looked at all the problems we had with with uh, fake news on that platform, that was largely the result of a problem they could solve but didn't want to solve because they felt it would hurt their revenue potential. Um, mm -hmm. And when I said earlier that I thought both Google and Facebook were at risk of going out of business, that's the kind of behavior that I think will eventually result in them either being broken up or uh, or shut down. The, this uh, this lack of ability to, to differentiate between what's doing what is right 
and what is wrong as, as opposed to what is profitable and what is not profitable. And as, and as long as companies aren't taking the, their lead ethical people seriously, um, you know, they, they, they gutted internal audit about a decade and a half ago. And that was the control structure that was supposed to assure that companies behaved ethically long term. And yet, uh, yet they blew it up because management didn't want the idea of, of internal audit looking over their shoulder and preventing them from doing things they wanted to do, even though those things are largely things they shouldn't have been doing. And, uh, and things like the financial class, uh, class we had towards the, uh, the end of the 2000s, uh, 2000, around 2008, 2009, was largely, the, uh, was largely an ethical uh, mistake that resulted from creating um, people that were responsible risk managers who had no authority uh, but would take all the responsibility for risks. So they were the ones that got shot when it when the when the systems failed, but it was at the system itself that was at fault. And so it, it's we have a really bad history here. And, th and that means that our concern with regard to AIs uh, acting badly at machine speed is a valid one uh, because uh, companies continue to show that they make really bad decisions when it comes to, to deciding between what makes money and, and what saves lives. And that seems to be if if you talk from an industry perspective, you know there's really a a, a a lot of push to let us let us handle this. We'll do the right thing. And you just pointed out that that the you know the track record is well. No, you actually probably won't do the right thing. And so th this is the I, I think this is this is the dilemma that that you know a lot of the regulators are are faced with is they they see the they see the writing on the wall. Uh, and they're trying to figure out how to uh, how to inject some, you know, well, essentially a forcing function. I, I, I got to say, this is one of those instances where where the legal community may, may actually prove to be uh, uh, a force of change, if you will, if they can figure out how to uh, how to bring the right lawsuits to, to, to change some of this behavior, because I'm not sure that the regulators are going to be able to do much uh, about this. Well, the issue is we've got we've got regulators that fundamentally don't understand the technology. We, we've got we've got an issue in, in governments where people that are really old are, are the ones that are are running the governments, and the technology is really new. And, and a lot of us that are much closer to the technology, we're having trouble wrapping our arms around it. That they're pretty much clueless, and so the end result it comes down to other questions that they that they they want raised or addressed, but has little to do with keeping us safe, which is kind of problematic. It, it's interesting. One of my other favorite sayings is that uh, despite what Hollywood will tell you, uh, any company that tries to kill either its customers or its employees doesn't stay in business for very long. But to some degree, AI, uh, you sometimes have to make that decision. You talked, Rob, earlier about, well, you know, I have to make the decision. Do I, you know, it was a false decision, obviously, we were talking about, but you know, do I hit a person in the street or do I kill the driver? You know, what company you know what 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 company manager is going to go up to the upper level executives and saying well we're going to make a we're going to make an ai based decision or at least we're going to guide the ai to um, kill our customers as opposed to uh, create a random problem first of all that discussion has all sorts of legal problems but i mean mm -hmm. but realistically how do you actually resolve that from a corporate standpoint well you know and this this has come up you know um, in in some of the the aba uh, you know, sort of scenarios. And, you know, so like in the case of, of the car, if you're a manufacturer, do you really actually want to have a record where you have, you, you have intentionally designed it to, you know, do something that would, you know, kill the kid or, or, or whatever. Um, and, and the companies just don't want to go there. One way mm -hmm. out is they, they can take the position of, well, our responsibility is to the driver or the owner of the vehicle. And so they focus all of the AI, the big data activities, the analytics, everything on, on the occupants of the vehicle, safety first for the occupants, everything else is secondary. And th that, that sort of approach is hard to sort of chip away at is cause it's like, it's an, a reason it's a reasonable, uh, well, it, it sort of passes the reasonable test of well, if you focus on on you know the vehicle, and the occupants of the vehicle, and anything outside of it is secondary, then um, then that will 
the theory is that will keep them out of trouble with with the legal community. It's not clear that that's going to work long term, but they can also talk about this is our focus as opposed to, I mean, can you imagine if it were, you know, the simulations where the, you know, the, the kid on the left, the kid on the right, and, you know, grandma in the middle, and, you know, what is the, I mean, just even talking to that, the public would, would be just... Uh, such a problem for any company that you know they're they're exploring what would happen that got into the press um it, it would be it'd be a, a a nightmare from a marketing perspective so well part of the fix i think is to start looking at autonomous vehicles since we're using them as the example is something very different than vehicles we have today uh, right now people don't really spend a lot of time thinking about how to make the elevator they're in go faster or, or avoid op obstacles or whatever and what we're talking about with autonomous vehicles are horizontal elevators um, once we reach once we reach a critical mass for, for most of the cars are autonomous then the human drivers are taken off the road in most models because the insurance liability for them gets so high that it's not reasonable and the insurance cost for the auto autonomous vehicles gets so low, it, 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 it's a fraction of what it currently is because the cars just never crash. Uh, and you can also do things like just slow the vehicles down. Um, a, a, a flat tire at 25 miles per hour is a hell of a lot less dangerous than a flat tire at 70 miles per hour. And if you're in the car and you can watch movies and you can read and you can do it, you really need, I mean, can't you just leave a little bit earlier in order to get in time? And plus, then you don't get the, the kinds of traffic problems we have today with cars coming in at different speeds hit different speed limits and and that causes the congestion everybody's kind of moving at, at the same speed heck we could even have scenarios where the vehicle you're in maybe the place where you actually live uh, it's a basic moving house it just goes wherever you need to meet and of course these days with regard to virtual meetings maybe you don't need to actually go every place you, you needed to go before reducing traffic and the opportunity for accidents rather significantly I did mm -hmm. want to hit on one thing I want about people asked the question about what about HAL in 2001, a, a space odyssey, which is, is kind of an interesting point because the reason HAL went off the rails in that movie is, is it was given a conflicting order. It was supposed to protect people and kill people at the same time. And that conflict made the AI insane. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm pretty sure that in most cases with our current technology, if you were to do something like that, the thing would just crash and, re and refuse to work. But if it, if it suddenly crashed while it's driving down the road uh, and it did not disable the automobile before it went down, that could certainly be problematic, particularly if you were sleeping in the back and not paying attention. Um, but, the, but it does showcase the absolute need to do heavy simulation with a lot of this stuff uh, up front and in its final form. In that HAL example, that modification was done at the very end after the after the platform was created so no opportunity for simulation and so the crash happened and the, the uh, logic fa failure happened in real time when the folks were out of space and a whole bunch of people died that's a, that's a that's a real problem uh, we and when i say that's a real problem i can remember the launch of windows 95 and i was one of the testers that was that was uh, that was testing the product and the uh, and it tested just fine uh, through all the test phases. And then at the very end, they implemented a number of fixes that never made it through beta. And it created the most unreliable experience at the end. That coupled with the fact they didn't test all the hardware that was going to be available because it wasn't available early enough. So the, so the, uh, so those kinds of practices can create huge problems for AIs. The, the final form of the AI has to be tested. Every patch and update has to be tested in simulation. It cannot be dropped live. On the on these systems while they're out in the road or out in public. Otherwise, if they're done wrong, those large scale crashes and and um, and problems are going to be real. But I mean, take an AI that's watching the electrical grid. You could have uh, you could have catastrophic problems like we had in Texas um, pretty much all the time unless you tested those systems rigorously before they were implemented, as opposed to throwing in live patches and allowing the failures to happen on a live grid. So. It, mm -hmm. A lot of this has to do with the fact that if you want an AI that's behaving ethically, you have to you have to test it rigorously before you deploy it. Not only initially, but after every patch, after every major update, uh, to make sure that those things don't blow stuff up. Something that we know about in IT, but I know all of us have been in positions where somebody's rolled out a patch in a major critical system, and then suddenly wake up the next morning and that system's down. It's hard down and it may not come up again anytime soon. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and, and I'll just give my plug in. And I was going to get to the how question um, just because, you know, Arthur C. Clarke, you know, obviously, you know, has been around for a long time. If you really want to get back to the uh, Socratic level discussions on artificial intelligence and robotics, you can look to early science fiction. You know, Asimov, Clark, some of the others were actually doing a lot of the ethical debates back then yeah. on how robots should behave. And I, I was going to finish with it. We've got a few more minutes, of, but I'll just ask the question here. Do we go back to something like Asimov's three laws in terms of artificial intelligence and start with that as the foundation to go, to go build a, a more effective, more ethical, more well-behaved AI? I mean, that's a really interesting question because I think a, a, a lot of people um, believe that that may actually be you know, how companies and regulators and lawyers are thinking about all this stuff, not realizing that they're, they're not necessarily core to, to uh, you know, the, the current state of AI. I mean, th those of us that have been you know, aware of this stuff in, in science fiction and whatnot, um, you know, probably would embrace it in some fashion, but it's not really been codified per se in in much of anything. It's it's like sitting off to the side. We we like sort of talk about it, but it's not really it's not really part of the the core discussions where where these decisions are actually being made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, starting that way would be good. The, the the three laws for anybody that does know them is as a first law is a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Second law, a robot must obey the orders given to it by a human except where such orders would conflict with the first law. Third law, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. And then of course after Asimov came up came up with that, he came up with several books that talked about how to get around those laws and kill Absolutely. people, but, 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 and show, and showcasing that, that, uh, that fundamentally any, any, any rule can be subverted, which then goes back to our question of ethics and, and whether or not, I mean, at the beginning, we're full circle and the, the fix for this problem begins and ends with how you set the morals and ethics that define the system and how you assure those moral ethics are um, are enforced and, and are immutable. If at any point in time um, the the laws you put in place to govern the system are violated, you're going to have significant consequential damages, and, and increasingly those damages will have to do with uh, with lives being lost. I noticed one of the people asking questions were asking about the ethics regarding a, an AI teacher in an online mm -hmm. classroom. One. Whether whether if an, a university replaces a human teacher, does that provoke um, create an ethics issue and it really it, then it really kind of depends on the nature of the teacher and the nature of the AI. Uh, it's inherently not ethical, uh, unethical, but, but but it's an, it's also inherently not ethical. It kind of depends on what, on what you're doing. Certainly we've had unethical teachers. Um, um, I don't think a, a quarter goes by. We, we don't hear about teachers that have dated students that that have, have done things that are uh, inappropriate in classrooms and been asked asked to step down. Um, if the AI is trained using the same data set the teacher is using to define their behavior, the AI is going to make those same mistakes. And so care has to be made as we develop the training sets for the AIs to make sure they don't do that. On the other hand, uh, we've got huge classroom sizes under the pandemic. We've got huge safety issues that an AI could address. You could create an AI system that could train uh, students individually based on their own unique strengths and weaknesses and allow them to progress at a much higher rate. I mean, right now, School curriculums are are largely designed generically. Bobby and 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 Jill in the same classroom with different backgrounds, different different ethnicities, different learning skills, different brains um, would behave would could behave very differently and better if the curriculum was specifically designed for their strengths and weaknesses. Maybe one stronger in math, one has better recollection, would be better in history, uh, and those things could be used to define the curriculum and, and train them. And a teacher, unless they're just, we're talking about a tutor that's that's focused on an individual student, can't do that granularly across a hundred students. But an AI could because an AI can scale. But if you but if you introduce bias into that AI at scale, uh -huh. then you've got bias teaching at scale yeah, as yeah. well. And so you you have to be able to take into account the the the. Um, the, the damage that could be done if you train the AI improperly and then deploy it at scale. 
Yeah, yeah, and that was exactly where I was going to go. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, the, the hint there is also a, a matter of uh, privacy as well, because to, to get to the point where you can respond to, you know, the individual's needs means you have an awful lot of understanding of how that, that, that you know, how that individual thinks, operates, and whatnot. And that that's a scary prospect when you when you add to the mix AI. It's like, hmm, can you exploit all of that uh, that insight in in ways that are really not ethical? Um, so I mean, exactly. And, and and again, human history being what it is, um, you know, I th I think there's a lot of concern about having having AI. Uh, a have access to to that kind of detail level, not so much because of what the AI would do, but what a human who was exploiting the AI might might uh, you know might do. I mean, where you can oh yeah, hacked AIs are a nightmare for everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, so we're we're fifty five minutes, actually all close to fifty six minutes, and I'm gonna I'm gonna switch back over here. And uh, because there's some things that we that we talked about, there's some things that, you know, we had said that we would be happy to talk about. And then there's things we have not touched at all. The ethics of a deep fake, uh, some of the, you know, some of the other aspects of data aggregation. I think there's a lot more that we could talk about. And I think this is a promise to say, hey, this is a this is the first of maybe a couple of uh, sure. webcasts that we'll be doing on AI and ethics. And, you know, Robin, Eric, I certainly want to thank you. And I want to thank you uh, for viewing this webcast as well. Um, there is that rate the webcast button. Please do that and provide us with feedback. Uh, we at SNEA very uh very seriously take your feedback and we look at ways to modify future bright talks or do new things so this webcast and a copy of the slides will be available at the SNEA educational library uh, and like i said you can download the slides as is and we will also be posting a uh, q a blog uh, there were a couple of questions we didn't get to and we'll actually expound on the questions that we already did answer in that q a blog and you'll find that at sneacloud.com you can always follow us on twitter at SNEA Cloud. And if you actually want to do more in terms of helping us make those decisions, if you want to learn more or participate, you can join the CS, SNEA, CSTI. Um, we meet regularly. We part, you can participate in that regular collaboration. You can hear about all of the work that Eric's doing in security and standards and ethics. And you can join and, and help us guide some of the future educational materials that we'll be doing. Everybody, I certainly want to thank you for attending. Please rate the webcast. And thank you very much. You all have a good day.